We now continue with the message. It will be based on Psalm 143. I'll ask you to have that bulletin insert or that loose leaf paper ready for a little later on. We'll, we'll read that um, psalm during the sermon. So may the Lord bless us as we reflect on this psalm of the Bible. And may the Lord come into our hearts and refresh us with the gospel. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you always. Amen. So, this past year in the state of California, it was the worst year for wildfires in history, by far. There were over 9,500 fires. 4.4 million acres burned. 10,500 buildings destroyed. $12 billion in damage. 31 people dead. It's a miracle it wasn't worse, really. Why was it such a bad year? I mean, how bad was it? You, think, you remember the hazy skies over Vegas here? People in New York had respiratory problems because of the fires in California. Why was it such a bad year? What caused all these fires? Well, it's an answer. Dry ground. Parched earth. Why was the ground so dry? Well, factors. It's been hotter, higher winds, but most of all, lack of water. Obviously, right? And so the, the experts and the firefighters have been researching this and trying to come up with a solution. And they ask themselves, what has to change to avoid this same terrible year we had, to avoid all these fires and properties destroyed and acres of beautiful forest burnt? Well, one thing they can do, and they've talked about it, is to, is to cut down the forests or kind of uh, prune them, if you will, get rid of all the brush, because that's kindling that feeds these fires. It's fuel for the fire. But... Really what they come down to it is this. What they need, the parched ground in California, what it needs is water. Yeah, California needs rain and snow. Yeah. Parched ground, dry ground needs water. When, the, when King David wrote, was inspired to write Psalm 143, he used the exact same illustration. Okay. He, he basically said, Lord, like the dry ground needs water, I need you. And we're going to hear that psalm now. It's not a real long psalm, about 12 verses. And I ask you to grab the sheet of paper there and you can follow along as I read it. Psalm 143. Hear the word of the Lord. Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness and righteousness, come to my relief. Do not bring your servant into judgment. For no one living is righteous before you. The enemy pursues me. He crushes me to the ground and makes me dwell in the darkness like those long dead. So my spirit grows faint within me. My heart within me is dismayed. I remember the days of long ago. I meditate on all your works and consider what your hands have done. I spread out my hands to you. I thirst for you like a parched land. Answer me quickly, Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I will be like those who go down to the pit. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. Rescue me from my enemies, Lord, for I hide myself in you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. For your name's sake, Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring me out of trouble. In your unfailing love, silence my enemies. Destroy all my foes, for I am your servant. When, when King David wrote these words, he was inspired. He was going through a really hard time in his life. Really bad. First of all, he had enemies that were looking to take him down, to harm him, not only to harm him, to kill him. The enemy, we're not exactly sure, could have been King Saul before he had even become king. He was hunting him down like an animal, trying to kill him. Then later you have terrible enemies. His own son, Absalom, wanted to kill his own dad and take his throne. So he's reflecting on it. He's got enemies after him. And David was, if you read the psalm, he's frustrated. Frustrated with the problems of life. He's tired of struggling. He's scared. He's doubting. His faith is weak. He feels guilty for his own sins. 
He doesn't know where to turn. It's kind of like he thinks, I, I got no hope. He doesn't see a light at the end of the tunnel. And he is just plain down. When he writes the words of, these, of this psalm, David, spiritually speaking, is not at a good point in his life at all. And, and he, so what does he do? He, he explains it like this. He, he says, I feel on the inside like dry ground. I feel like parched earth. But he also knew where to go. He also knew who the water was that he needed. And that water that he needed to refresh his parched and dried up soul and heart was the Lord. And so that's exactly where David went. He went to the Lord and he explains it. In the, David was a poet. He was very gifted. And so you read his psalms and they're done in poetry. And so he used examples for us. And so he, he says, it's kind of like this, Lord Jesus, I extend, I reach out to you. I reach out to you. Like, like the parched, dry ground needs water. I need you, Lord. And he just reached out to them. And what did he do? He prayed to him, knowing that the Lord could help him. He, he meditated on his word. He went to his word. And, and in the word of the Lord, he remembered some things. He said, I remember your wonderful deeds. He remembered that the Lord is God Almighty who could help him. He remembered that the Lord was his Savior who had already forgiven him. And he repented of those sins. See, King David felt like this. He said, I, Lord, I, I feel like dry ground, parched ground. I need you. And so he went to the Lord and he found the spiritual, refreshing spiritual water that his soul needed. He went to the Lord and he found comfort. He found calm. He found peace. He found forgiveness. He found salvation. He found strength. You see, David didn't want to live the way he was living. He said, I, I feel lousy. I feel scared. I, I no hope. He goes, I feel guilty. He didn't want to live like that. He wanted to have a stronger faith, a better relationship with God. He, he wanted to serve God with a cheerful heart with his gifts. So he went to the Lord. He said, I'm, I'm reaching out to you, Lord. And the and there he found him. He found comfort. And he found in the Lord refreshment for his part's soul. Renewal. He was renewed. He was strengthened. He was comforted. And he then, in the Lord, was ready. Ready to take on the problems of life with the Lord's help. And ready to serve the Lord again with a cheerful heart, using his gifts to praise him. The question is this. Have you ever felt like King David did when he wrote Psalm 143. Have you ever felt like, on the inside, like parched, dry ground? Have you ever been frustrated with life's problems? We all have, haven't we? Have you ever been frustrated with your marriage and your family? If you say no, you're lying because you're saying that you're married to a perfect person and that's not the case. You're married to a sinner. So we've all been frustrated. Have you ever been frustrated with your kids? And if you say no, then you're lying as well because you're saying that your kids have never sinned. No, we've all been frustrated with life's problems. We've been, have you ever been frustrated with your job? Who hasn't? Have you ever felt confused because things aren't going better in your life? We all have, haven't we, at times? Have you ever felt scared thinking that life's problems are too big we all have. Have you ever felt paralyzed? If you read the psalm, David kind of felt paralyzed, not seeing a way out to a difficult situation. We all have, haven't we? Have you ever felt without hope, like there's just no light at the end of the tunnel? We all have. Have you ever felt guilty because of your sins? Who hasn't? Have you ever had enemies that wanted to take you down? No, David had his enemies. They were going after him. They wanted to take him down. They wanted to make him eat dust. He says, take him down to the pit. We all have an enemy like that. It's called Satan, who wants to destroy our souls and make us eat dust in hell forever. That's what he wants. So we all at times feel like King David did when he wrote this dried up, parched ground. And there's only one thing we can do about it. 
There's only one thing we can do about it. That's go to the Lord Jesus. That's reach out. I love that illustration in this psalm. He says, I'm extending my hands to you as the parched, as the parched earth is yearning and thirsting for water. Lord, I'm thirsting for you. I'm reaching out to you and I'm extending my hands. That's the only thing we can do in life. Reach out to the Lord in faith, praying to him for help, diving into his word, studying and listening to his word. Reach out to him because the Lord Jesus is the spiritual water that our dried and parched souls and hearts so desperately need. He is the living water. Listen to his invitation. What is the what does the word say in John chapter 7? On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. We need Jesus. We need him. He is the living water that our souls, our parched and dry souls, so desperately need. So, brother, sister, in the faith, go to him. Go to Jesus. He takes your sins away. He erases your guilt. Go to Jesus. As Psalm 46 said, he is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Go to Jesus. He does comfort us and strengthen us when we're down. Go to Jesus. He is our guide. He gives and renews us. Go to Jesus. Sadly, unfortunately, sometimes we treat Jesus like a fire extinguisher. When do people use fire extinguishers? Not that often. Only when there's a what? Fire. Right? My old church, they once found this fire extinguisher in the basement that hadn't been renewed and worked on for like 15 years. And the fire inspector said, you gotta, you gotta renew that, you gotta, you gotta give maintenance to that thing or get a new one in here. But that's the way fire extinguishers are, right? You only use them once in a while when, when you're in trouble, right? When there's a fire. And sometimes we treat Jesus like that, as if he's a fire extinguisher. We only go to him when we're in trouble. Well, problem with that is when we treat Jesus like a fire extinguisher, just going to him in trouble, we're going to end up drier than ever on the inside, parched. See, when people only go to the Lord Jesus when they're in trouble, here's a, there's, there's something fundamentally wrong with their thinking, and they're not in touch with reality, and we fall into that sometimes. This is the deal. We are always weak sinners, so we always need Jesus, our living water. So brother, sister in the faith, reach out to him. Extend yourself to Jesus all the time, always. Pray to him every day. Listen to his word regularly. Come and take his supper, the sacrament of the altar, on a regular basis. Go to Jesus all the time for a stronger faith. Go to Jesus continually for spiritual strength against sin. Go to Jesus on a regular basis, all the time. Make it an, the most important thing in your life for forgiveness, for salvation, for spiritual gifts. Go to him regularly so that you can use those gifts as he, as he empowers you with a cheerful heart, with more zeal, with more love. Go to Jesus. Go to Jesus in prayer, regularly in the word, in faith, in repentance, and he will refresh your soul, and he will quench your spiritual thirst, and he will renew you as on eagle's wings, and he will comfort you, and he will strengthen you, and he will guide you. Hoover Dam. We should be proud right here in Las Vegas. Over in Boulder City, Hoover Dam, it's one of the most impressive structures in all of the world. Every year, millions of tourists go to visit it, right? What does Hoover Dam do? I mean, it just captures the water of the Colorado River, right? And forms Lake Mead, it's a big lake. The largest, one of the largest reservoirs in the world. And, and so, three states in this country depend on the water of Lake Mead for its public use. Yeah. California, southern part of California, Arizona, and Nevada. So, by law, every year they use 
7.5 million, this is Q, or what is it? Acre feet of water. I don't know what an acre foot of water is. Okay, but it's some quantity of water. So 7.5 million acre feet of water are put aside for public use to be divided up between the three states, California, Arizona, and Nevada. Here it is. By law, California gets 58% of the water. By law, Arizona gets 37% of the water. And by law, Nevada, we only get 4% of that water. They're cheap with us. People in Nevada have complained, and they've gotten nowhere. Well, that's law. That's the way it is in Nevada. Yeah, they're pretty cheap with their water. Good thing the Lord Jesus is not cheap with his spiritual water. He is not cheap with his spiritual blessings. They're never-ending. You get all you want. Hear these words from Jesus. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. Let us go to Jesus always. And we will never be thirsty. And we will never be dry. I'm going to end this message with these beautiful, inspiring words from our Savior, our water of life. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Amen.